Well, good evening. Good evening. My name is Dustin Turner. I serve as the equipping pastor. As Pastor Rob said, I'm your favorite equipping pastor. Uh, Matthew Weaver's been reminding me all day that I'm the only equipping pastor, so I don't know how that encouraging that's supposed to be, but I appreciate that, that feedback. Uh, but welcome. We want to welcome you guys here. Uh, you caught Pastor Rob's video. Number one, I uh, just want to you guys to just be reminded of how thankful you need to be for Pastor Rob and just his continued uh, pursuit of the Lord for vintage, but also the relationships that he's continuing to build with other partners. And so I don't know if you remember just a few months ago having Pastor uh, Levi Lusco here and uh, preach through his book, Through the Eyes of a Lion. And so now Pastor Rob got to reciprocate that and be at Fresh Life in Montana. And so it's so cool to be able to, we were talking about that this, this morning, to be able to just to see all of the relationships that we have literally all over the world, that God is doing stuff through Vintage Church in places like Mumbai, India, Malaysia, and Montana. And so I just want you to know that without, the, without number one, the Lord, and without number two, the vision of our lead pastor, Rob Wilton, those sorts of things wouldn't happen, or at least not happen in the degree that they are. And so continually be, be praying for Pastor Rob as he's pursuing that and pushing that forward and moving us in that direction. But we are thankful for him. Uh, he shared a lot of stuff in that video. I don't know if you caught everything that's going on. Some of this relates to this location. And so if you're not familiar, you can check out a lot at our more table back there with our video and some of the books. But we are expanding our auditorium at our Jefferson location, and that is going to be done April 24th. So that's not, that's not too far away. And so we're going to be out of our tent, and we're going to not be nomadic anymore and have a permanent location. And so we're really excited about that. The bummer is that we can't get a, an extension on our permit, and we have scoured Jefferson Parish looking for a place to meet and just really nothing panning out. So Jefferson, our Jefferson location is going to be joining you guys here in the mornings at 9 and 11. And here's what's really cool about that. We have solidified some kid space directly across the street, which is awesome for this short period for a 9 and 11 crowd. But this is where you guys can continue to pray and it can be very exciting for you is that there's a very good chance that we're going to have kid space for the Orleans location for at least the foreseeable future, which means we might be able to go to a morning time with kids space to expand our reach, to be able to reach more people, connect with more people. And so be praying for that. There's a lot of stuff involved in that and a lot of things that have to happen along the way, but some really cool stuff is coming out of some of the adversity that we've been facing along the way. And so some really cool stuff happening uh, that's going on. If you don't have a Bible, raise up your hand. We've got Bibles for you. We'd love to be able to get you one, and you can take that as a gift from us. Over the past few weeks, we've been unpacking. We've been in this big, Jesus, uh, big easy Jesus series, and we've been unpacking these I am statements that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. So, just over the past few weeks, you can see things like Jesus saying, I am the bread in John 6, or I am the light in John 8. I am the door and I am the good shepherd in John 10. And today, what, I'm, what I've been tasked to do, Pastor Rob left me with this task, and it's basically this, is to continue to talk about the big easy Jesus, but ask and answer a particular question. And so tonight, the question that we're going to be asking is this, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And I'd encourage you, we have a few of these left. They're at our resource center right back there. But we have these cool infographics that we recently created. On the front side is uh, who is Jesus. So it talks a lot about his person. And on the back is what has Jesus done. So his work. And so we have a few of those left at our resource center. You can grab one on your way out. You can also find this resource online on our website as well. But here, here's the reality about the question of who is Jesus. How many of you guys have ever participated in or heard of the DTR conversation? What's so funny? I mean, how many of you, DTR, right? Define the relationship. Now, does everybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you have ever been a part of a define the relationship conversation? Hopefully, several of you. Somewhere along the way, you're in a relationship with somebody. It doesn't even have to be romantic. I mean, it could be like a friendship, a business job. It could be any of those things. But somewhere along the way, 
You have got to have, whether it's an implicit or explicit conversation with somebody about what's going to happen moving forward, right? I shared this in in the earlier gathering. My wife and I have been married in July. It'll be nine years. And some people might think this is like incredibly unromantic and not exciting at all. I like to consider myself a romantic, but also practical, okay? Sometimes those things don't go together, but I try to make them work. And so when my wife, Rachel, and I were dating, we've been dating for one year, literally on our one-year dating anniversary, we went and looked for rings. And so we had gotten to that place, real conversation, we're ready to get married, we want to get married, but here's what I did. I wanted to make sure that we got the ring that she wanted, okay? So I pulled no, I pulled no punches. We went to the ring stores, she picked out the ring she wanted, she tried it on, and I bought it right there. Now, some of you, I know, I know, I got haters, right? How unromantic. Well, here's the thing. I didn't ask her to to marry me right then and there. I waited. We even went on a date, like a real fancy date one time before I asked her, and she swore that that was the moment, that was the time. And I took her to this park. We went to this nice restaurant. I dressed up. I wore like a a jacket, which, you know, at like 19 or 20, I never did. And I didn't ask her. And she was furious. And I'm like, what? I don't understand. We're, we're on a great date. So this DTR, well, later I did ask her to marry me. It was a surprise. She couldn't believe it. We were in Gatlinburg going down a mountain. It was romantic. She loved it, okay? Here's the reality. Somewhere, whether it was implicit or explicit, Rachel and I had a conversation that we define this relationship, that this thing is moving forward. We want to be married. We want to spend the rest of our life together. That's the sort of conversation, whether we want to believe it or not, that all of us have to have of Jesus. All of us in this room, whether this side of eternity or the other side, are going to have to have that conversation of defining the relationship. Who is Jesus? Jesus said that very same thing in Mark 8 when he's with his disciples All of these crowds are around them and they're all asking, you know, they're all saying certain things about Jesus. And they're saying, some people say you're the prophet. Some people say this. And Jesus looks at him and he says, who do you say that I am? And at the end of the day, that's the question that all of us have to ask. And the reality of it is, is that if we wait and answer that question on the other side of eternity after death, it's simply too late. And so all of us are here tonight I, and I want to, you, for you to ask this question of yourself. Who is Jesus? And we're going to go in John 1, and we're going to look at how John answers this question of who Jesus is. So we're going to be in John 1, 1 through 18. I want to read it and then go back through. And this is what John writes. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. 
So what we're going to do is unpack this passage and answer this question, who is Jesus? And now we're going to do something a little different. We're not going to kind of go verses 1 through 5, 6 through 8, so on and so forth. We're going to kind of go from the front and the back at the same time until we're going to culminate in the middle. And I'm going to show you why as we do that. And so the first part of this passage is in verses 1 through 5. And when, when John answers this question, he answers this question first with this. Who is Jesus? What John says is that Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully God. Now, this is what's important about this story in this passage. You have to remember that you and I are reading this passage almost 2,000 years after it was written. People have been talking about Jesus being divine for 2,000 years. And so for some of us in this room, it might be like, okay, so what? Jesus is God. Some of you might be like, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. And we'll walk through that as we go. But you have to remember and recognize that for these people, for the Jews who Jesus came to, for someone to be identified as God, especially someone who was flesh and blood, was absolutely ridiculous. It would have made no sense. And so it's an earth-shattering and earth-shaking thing for John to say some things that he does in verses 1 through 5. And he, he lays out some very significant things. One of the first things that he says is he, he brings up this idea of the word. Now this is important. There's a reason that that word is capitalized in your Bibles. It's a Greek word that refers to logos. That's the Greek word, logos. Now, What's important about this is that because it's a Greek word, it carries with it an idea in Greek. This idea in Greek is this, this idea that the logos is the kind of self-governing principle of the cosmos. That if you want to think of something, this is what Greek philosophers talked about when they were studying the world. They would have said that the logos designed and created all of the universe, that it was this self-governing or self-identifying principle. But here's the thing. Jewish people, like John, wrote this gospel in Greek. But when he was writing, he was carrying with him Hebrew principles, Jewish ideas. And so even though the Logos refers to this idea of a self-governing principle, at the same time, he's bringing Hebrew ideas into it. And any time... Anytime a Jew would have talked about the word, it would have hearkened back and referred back to the Old Testament. Because you have to remember that in the Old Testament, when, when God is ever talked about or referred to or shown, he's always invisible. The Bible talks about that, that God is spirit. There's no way for us to physically see God, but God would reveal himself. And when God would reveal himself in the Old Testament, it would always be by his word. So when the prophets would come on the scene and they would come to the people and they would say things, and if it was from God, they would say things like, thus saith the Lord, or God says, or this is the word of the Lord. So for John, to use this idea of the word is hearkening back to God revealing himself. And then John is making some very unique and specific claims to who this word is. Check these three things that he says in verse 1. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. Does that sound familiar? If you go to the very beginning, Genesis 1, 1 through 3, this is what that says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. John keeps talking about Jesus, right? Being the light. And there was light. So, What's important to recognize is that when Jews would read Genesis 1, 1 through 3, they weren't trying to understand and unpack how all of creation came about scientifically. What they were doing is coming to the fact that in the beginning, nothing else existed and that there was only one who was God and creator, which means there's nothing before him. There's, there's nothing. It's just God. 
But for John to say in the beginning was the word, he's beginning to associate the fact that yes, God was there, but the word was also there before all of creation. Which means the word supersedes anything created, anything physical, light, sound, space, time, material. And then he goes on to say, and the word was with God. So not only was the word before, in the beginning, before anything, but it was also with God. That's significant because in the Old Testament, nothing would have been placed on the same level as God. Right? That's, that would have been considered idolatry to put anything up next to God and say this person or this thing sits at the same level as God would have been considered idolatry. But John says, and this word was with God. You see the picture he's painting. So he's making these subtle things. He's in the beginning. He's with God. And then he makes this very bold claim at the end of verse 1. And the word was God. Now, did you catch? He's not said anything. He's not said the name Jesus yet. In fact, he only says the name Jesus one time in this entire passage in verse 17. But he's making this point to say that this person, Jesus, is not just anybody. He's not just one of the boys. He's not just this person that hung out on earth and died a criminal's death because he was a criminal, but that this Jesus is this word who was from the very beginning and who was with God. And because he was from the beginning and with God, he is actually God. And so you have this man, remember, and think about it from the perspective of the Jews. They're reading this several decades after Jesus, maybe 40 to 50 years after Jesus' death. And they're remembering this person who walked the earth, ate, slept, drank, drank, and died. And John is writing, this is not just anybody. This person was from the beginning. He was with God and he is God. Powerful things that he's saying about Jesus. At the very end, in 16 through 18, particularly in verse 18, let's just read that. John writes, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So John again is going back to saying, Jesus is the one who is revealing God to people. And did you catch the way he uses the word God? said there's no one but God but then God the God God is sitting at God the Father's right hand to say that not only is Jesus revealing God but he can reveal God because he is God so he begins to answer this question with who is Jesus Jesus is fully divine In verses 6 through 11 and 14 through 15, he goes on and he answers this question. Jesus is not just fully divine, but he's also fully human. This is what the text says in verses 6 through 11. In verses 6 through 8, it talks about uh, John the Baptist coming. Verses 9 through 11, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. There's some really important stuff in just those few verses. Number one, we know about John the Baptist. Other writers in the first century wrote about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, and he was a literal, physical, historical figure. No one doubts that a person named John the Baptist did not exist. So this man was on the earth, not proclaiming about his own coming, but about the coming of someone else. And so if there is this literal figure, John the Baptist then perhaps there's a literal human named Jesus who John the Baptist is pointing to. It talks about in verse 10, Jesus being in the world. To be in the world means to be physical and living and alive and at least a human. And then in verse 11, it goes on to say 
He came for his own people, but his own people did not receive him. And what John is writing there in arguing for is that Jesus is Jewish. Now, I don't know about you. I've never met any Jewish aliens or animals or anything like that. To be Jewish means you have to be human, right? Are we all agree on that? So... Part of the fact is that Jesus is Jewish, that he came from a Jewish lineage. And if he came from a Jewish lineage, then he must have been human. Some other things to look at, just not in this verse, but just to think about. He was born of a woman. Jesus had a human body. He had a human body in that he grew. In Luke, we hear about him growing in stature from being a baby to a teenager to an adult. He got tired, he thirsted, he hungered, and then he died. If you go and you look in the other Gospels and you you see things like that Jesus had emotions. There were times that when Jesus' life and ministry, he got angry. When he went into the temple and he saw what the people were doing in the temple, it angered him to the point of flipping over tables. In another place in the book of John, his best friend dies, Lazarus. And the Bible says Jesus wept. Jesus didn't weep because he missed his opportunity to perform a miracle and heal the guy. Jesus wept because his best friend died. So many of the same emotions that you and I have and deal with and struggle with or the the physical things that we work through are the very same things that Jesus dealt with. All of those are clues and, and, and examples into his humanity. But the best part is in verses 14 through 15, particularly verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, here's what we know about Jesus from this passage. Number one, what John has done. This is the first time if you go back and you look at verse one. In verse 1, he talks about the the word. The the, the next time that he talks about the word is in verse 14. And now he is saying, he's moving away from the fact that Jesus is divine, this word is divine, this word is God, to saying this word that is God, that is divine, has now put on flesh. He has become human. And then uh, John uses some significant language here. At the end of verse 14, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, what's significant about that is when the people that were reading this gospel, when they would have read that word, they would have had a mental picture go off in their mind immediately. As a Jew reading that word, they would have thought about the tabernacle. And if you're not familiar with the tabernacle, in the book of Exodus and throughout the Pentateuch, the people of Israel come out of, the, out of Egypt into the wilderness. And when they're in the wilderness, God commands them to build a tabernacle, a massive, huge, semi-permanent tent. And this tent is important because this tent is where the presence of God is going to dwell which is significant. It's important for the people of Israel that the presence of God be in their midst. But here's the thing about this tabernacle and about the presence of God is that not anybody could just come up to God and say, hey, how you doing? The temple, this tabernacle was divided into two rooms. Number one, you could only, you only could be Jewish to be able to even get around the tabernacle. And number two, to even get into the tabernacle, you had to be a priest which means you had to be of the lineage of the Levites. And then, not just that, this holy place you could walk into, but the most holy place where the presence of God actually dwelt, only the high priest who was one individual, one person, one human being could walk into that room. And the other bad news about that is he could only do that one day a year on the Day of Atonement. So when John writes about the flesh dwelling with men and and, and dwelling and making its place on earth, the Jews would have immediately thought about the tabernacle. They would have immediately thought about the presence of God and verses like this would have come to mind. Exodus 33, 18 through 20. 
Moses says to God, please show me your glory. And God says, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But this is what God says to Moses. You cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. Exodus 40, 34 through 35, the tabernacle is complete. The cloud comes on the tabernacle. The cloud is the physical embodiment of the presence of God. And this is what it says. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Why is all of that important? Is because... Even though God's presence was resting and dwelling in the midst of the people, there was still a great divide that only the people could get so close and God was still very distant from the people. But what John writes in John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he goes on to see that glory that was in the tabernacle, that glory that was dwelling, that no one could see. The the fact that Moses could not see God, it says, and we have seen the glory, his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The reality of it is this, is that in the Old Testament, prior to Jesus, you and I could only get so close to God. While God was personal and present and wanted his presence in our midst, it was Jesus. Jesus being the word fully divine that put on the flesh, that dwelt among us, that allowed us to be close and connected to God. The presence of God came down and because he couldn't get close, chose to dwell with us by putting on flesh and being like us. Now, again, step out of whatever sort of bubble that you've been in and just try to think about that fresh with new, fresh eyes. It's incredible that the God of the universe, the God that has made all things, the God that continues to sustain and hold the universe together, simply by saying the universe is going to maintain itself, chose to dwell in our midst. What incredible news. And so John is writing to say this, this Jesus Wow, Jesus, he is, he is fully divine. He is fully God. And at the same time as being fully God, he is fully human. But what, what John is writing is not just to give us some neat, cool theological truth to tuck in our back pocket for a rainy day when we want to get into an argument with somebody. John is making an argument, giving us implications for why it matters and why it is important that Jesus is fully God and fully human. And this is, this is what gets to the very crux, the very middle, the very foundation of this passage in verses 12 through 13. And this is what I was telling you about for the nerds in the room. You're going to love this, this uh, little ditty I got. It's called a chiasm. It's going to come up here. Oh, look at that. It's a little, they'll fix it in just a second. It's a little messed up over there. Some of you guys have no idea what this is. And you're just, what are we talking about? This is important. So when you and I, it's important, but you don't understand it because we're not Jewish. We don't think like, you know, first century Jews. When you and I rank things, we usually rank things from least to greatest, greatest to least, right? So if I gave you a list, I love nature. I love books. I love my children. I love my wife. You're probably thinking, okay, I think he's going from least to greatest, right? Not, not greatest to least. Jews didn't think like that, or they didn't write like that. Oftentimes what they would do is they would work their way, and the thing that's in the very middle is the most important thing that they're trying to argue for and write for. So when you look at this right here, A and A dash, What that is, is that's John arguing and writing about 
Jesus being fully divine, fully God. And then when you get to B, B B-C, C- that is John arguing and writing about Jesus being fully human. And then in verses 12 through 13, he gets to the most significant thing that he's trying to argue for. And this is what he says. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. What John is trying to argue is that because Jesus is fully God, because Jesus is fully human, Jesus has will and will continue to give life. That's what he's arguing for. That's what he's giving to us. What he's trying to show is that when Jesus came onto the scene, he was trying to show everybody else that if you think the life that you have, if you think everything that you are, your identity, your achievements, your accomplishments, who you think you are, who other people think you are, if that is all that your life consists of, it will leave you feeling empty, hopeless, and with nothing. But it's Jesus, Jesus coming and being fully God and fully human that brings life. And this life is a life that's to the abundant and the fullest. It's not just this idea of life of I can just be, I don't have to go to hell. I can live in eternity and dance with angels and fly and have wings. Some of those things aren't true, by the way. But what, what, what John is writing and what Jesus is saying is that no life and abundant life can happen now. That you can have life to the fullest. And the reason you can have life to the fullest is because that life is being found in being made a child of God. What John is arguing for is to say, listen, from the very beginning, from Genesis to Revelation, God's desire has to, for him to make a people of his own. For him to redeem a people and call them his own children. That's what he did with Israel and that's what he did with the church and through Jesus. And so God's desire is that he would make himself a people to have, to love and to save. But the point of it is, is that it's not a physical birth. That's what he says at the end of verse 13. But it is a birth from God. Similar thing happens in John 3. One of my favorite stories because it's just you know it's Nicodemus and the idea of being born again and Nicodemus just doesn't get it he's like I just don't know what it means to be born again I mean you want me to go back into my mother's womb I don't how does that work physically and I just I think it's funny the mothers in the room don't but I think it's funny this is what this is what John 3 says Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is where it gets funny. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Don't don't laugh at Nicodemus. You'd be asking the exact same question. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from. Or where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. What Jesus, or what John is writing about Jesus in 1, John 1, 12 through 13, is that to have real life, to have abundant life comes through birth, new birth. And not new physical birth, but spiritual birth. And the idea of being born again, or to have a spiritual rebirth, or to be regenerated, is this idea that can only come through what John says. He gives what the people did that they believed and received Jesus. John says the people received Jesus and they believed him. Now, there's a part of that at at one level that is so incredibly simple, right? I mean, wow, it's just... 
believe and receive. But there's a part of that that is so much deeper, so much more, because what it, what it requires is not, yes, this simple faith, but also this, this trust. That in the New Testament or the Old Testament, when someone believed or received Jesus or God, it was this element of complete and utter faith, meaning I don't know everything, but this is what I do know. Jesus is who he says he is and what he did actually happened. I'm willing to give my entire life to that. I'm willing to place all of who I am in Jesus and who Jesus is and in what he has done. And that is incredibly simple and yet so difficult. But that's what Jesus requires of us. So this question that John gets to, you know, he, he didn't know the DTR conversation, but I think this is exactly what he's writing about in John, in John 1, is that, listen, all of you are going to have to answer this question, who is Jesus? And what I want you to know is that Jesus is fully God and he's fully human. And because of those things, you can have life. 2,000 years later, that is no different. Tonight, you can have life. Will you receive and believe Jesus? Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for such incredible truth that you came down in the form of Jesus and put on flesh, being fully God and fully human, and died to give us life. God, tonight may we receive and believe Jesus. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.